there online the stream is on i think yeah nice 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 oh we have many players today also nice Hello and welcome once more to this Red Gaming Tech video and myself, Amata. As always, I'm here with the latest news from the tech world from the last 24 or so hours as of the 18th of April. Hope you guys are all enjoying your Saturday. I've spent this morning playing Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's really, really good. I mean, I know everyone's saying that, so that isn't a surprise, but still. Anyway, we're going to kick off today's proceedings. <laughs> Oh, I'm into the game. Nice. Sense controller. Now, obviously, none of us know how this controller is actually going to be to actually use until well, we have it in our hands, obviously. And the design of it has been a touch divisive amongst gamers, to say the least. But we have some interesting comments from Pete Samuels, the managing director of Supermassive Games, who spoke in an interview with Game Reactor. Now, of course, you can find their interview linked in the description below this video. I suggest you go give it a read. So, he touched on a few things, but the thing I want to talk about is his excitement for the DualSense controller and the tactile features. He said, quote, Obviously, it's really exciting for us. As you say, we've had some experience, not just with Intel Dawn, but we had spent a couple of years working in VR and making some games in VR. and got to play with some stuff, including voice control, uh, in one of the VR titles that we did. You mentioned the PS5 DualSense controller and Listen, I don't play up here, we've been having some chats about that for a little while now about how we're going to use it. The whole tactile thing, as much as we can transfer what you'd expect the character's experience to be directed back to the player, I think the better attachment you feel to the characters. So essentially what he's saying is that he's excited to get stuck in to see what they can do, how they can play around with these new features and how they can use it to improve immersion. And I feel like as long as developers go in with this sort of right attitude of like, okay, how can we use this particular feature on the controller or any of the other features on the controller, to be fair, to improve the Give players. Give me a break, I can't, like just tacking it even on, I can hey, you're doing shiny thing, that's my not head. really good. I mean, obviously the, the track uh, the PS4 uh, DualShock 4 controller didn't really see really much use of like Killzone, which was a launch title. Didn't really see much use at all. It became kind of like just an extra button for like the map or whatever was generally uh, what it was used for. So hopefully we can see these features being used uh, a bit more throughout games in a less sort of gimmicky fashion, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, we're going to move over now to a bit of an update regarding Ryzen chipset drivers. Now, in case you weren't aware, perhaps this has not affected your if you've just missed the news, there were some issues floating around with the Ryzen chipset driver recently and AMD have released a fix for these issues but unfortunately these, this fix has also caused issues of its own at least for some people. Now, in case you're wondering what these issues actually were basically according to a thread on Reddit which of course you can find linked in the description below some people were having the insulation get stuck at 0% on the progress bar However, for other people, nice. it's seemingly yeah, successfully yeah. installed with no issues, but not completely. Eventually, there'll be a pop-up saying, hey, actually, um, sorry about that, but we need to restart. So, obviously, people were a bit concerned that they thought, you know, they would think they've installed it when they actually haven't, and this could potentially cause issues in the future. And, obviously, AMD has pushed out a new version of the chipset driver, uh, 2.04.04.111, just rolls right off the tongue and show you the grief. Now, according to some users on ComputerBase.de, while this may have fixed the issues with the installer, which is being called Error 1720, it has caused whole new issues. And according to reports, the GPIO driver, that being General Purpose I.O. controller, isn't always updated to the latest version, and some people are reporting incorrect operating voltages and increased power consumption from the processor. Not exactly great, I'm sure you would agree, and apparently some of these issues may be fault of Ryzen Master. Now, AMD is investigating the issue after Computer Space did flag it up with them, and obviously are asking people to send over log files. So if you are experiencing these issues that I've just described, uh, go over to Computer Space, you've wanted to go translate it unless you know how to read German, 
um, just to get the links of where to actually. Why? That's lucky bastard. For your perusal of the computer base link as well as the original uh, Reddit thread. Anyway, we're going to move over to our next AMD topic, which is regarding AMD Renoir. This is specifically regarding the hard launch date, or launch window, as I should say, uh, to be more accurate, of the Ryzen 4900H. And this is according to an article from WCCFTech.com. Now, obviously, you can find also their article uh, linked below if you wish to give it a look-see. But essentially what they're saying is that according to the information they have received from their sources, the availability of these parts will not happen until June 2020. So essentially we will start to see the big laptop manufacturers start to release uh, these machines with the Ryzen Renoir uh, APUs on them including the 4900H from June to the second half of 2020. However, for the moment, Asus's Zephyrus G does seem to have an exclusive on the Renoir APU. So essentially, we're going to see Renoir come out, start coming out, sorry, should I say, in June, and it's going to go forward into the second half of 2020. Obviously, June is kind of like the start of the second half of 2020, so you could expect some parts to launch first and then others to come later, etc, etc. Obviously, we don't have an exact timeline of what's going to happen. This is just a rough release window of, hey, it's going to start in June and go through into the second half of 2020. Anyway, we're going to move over now to the B550 once more. Now, recently we did discuss the B550 and how, in our opinion, it is so, 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 so late. But according once again to WCCF Tech, we are going to be seeing the B550 motherboards launching on June the 16th and we will see an announcement from AMD on May the 21st so in just over a month's time we will finally learn exactly what is going on with B550 including pricing and all that good stuff. Now obviously late is definitely better than never but I do wonder how well these are actually going to do. Tough to say, of course, as per normal, I don't have my crystal ball to hand, but I'm definitely interested to see what the skinny is for the B550. I think if the price is right, these could definitely do very, very well, considering that the B550 will be the first mid-range motherboards to have native PCIe for support. But speaking of things motherboards, we actually have something interesting for Comet Lake motherboards, that being the Z490. So essentially what we have here is a bit of an oops from ASUS, they have accidentally posted a listing early for their Prime Z490P and Z490A motherboards, uh, but we do have Momomo on Twitter to thank for this initial uh, discovery. Now if you look at the page now, it actually is for the Z390P, but at the time it was very confusing because the text around the motherboard itself said stuff like the fact that it was still the Z390, but the motherboard itself clearly showed that it was a Z490P uh, that was being shown in this particular image. So it does seem that someone over at ASUS definitely got their wires a touch crossed. Um, I'm looking at the page now and it has been fixed. The image is now a Z390P, uh, but at the time it was a Z490P, so whoops. So we could probably expect to see some more information come out about this in the next few days. Tough to gain much from this given that the text is obviously not correct with the image itself, but still looking forward to learning more about what's going on uh, with the Comet Lake S platform. So we're going to move on now to our next topic, which is regarding Crisis Remastered. Now you guys have undoubtedly heard the news, but I just wanted to cover this because we were covering the rumours uh, that it was going to be remastered, so it seemed only fair to me that we do just quickly cover the update that yes, it has been officially confirmed by the Crisis Twitter account that we will be seeing Crisis Remastered come to PC, PS4, Xbox One, and it will also come to the Nintendo Switch as well. So as I said, just very quickly wanted to update, I think this is going to go down very very well indeed. 
I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how it actually looks and plays and what ray tracing we're going to see implemented and all that sort of stuff because Crytek did release a demo shortly uh, a while ago that was a platform agnostic ray tracing that could be used on NVIDIA or AMD. Uh, so it could be very, very cool. I'll we'll have to wait and see. So we're going to finish things up on a really weird note. I, yeah, I'm just going to say weird. It's something regarding a Sony patent. So essentially they have patented a robotic gaming companion that reacts to your emotions. And it is a actual trademark that has been listed on the US Patent and Trademark Office website. And as you can see, in the link below this video and on screen it is depicted as a sort of floofy little guy that sits next to you on your sofa while you play video games so the pattern mentions a few interesting things like how the robot is going to be quote unquote autonomous to the point where it could sit beside you of its own will rather than you picking it up and placing it next to you so Honestly, this whole thing is really weird and it feels like this shouldn't be a real thing. Reading this article, I genuinely feel like I've slipped into some sort of alternate dimension because the pattern also describes the robot as having a quote, feeling deduction unit, which basically can detect and act upon your emotions and can evaluate quote, feeling indexes such as joy, anger, love and surprise, and even has a biological sensor that can track your heart and sweating rate. However, Sony said later on in the patent quote, it is expected that the user's affinity with the robot is increased and motivation for playing a game is enhanced by the robot viewing the gameplay next to the user and being pleased or sad together with the user. Further, regarding not only the game but also movie, television program or the like, it is expected that the user may enjoy content more by viewing the content with the robot as compared to viewing it alone. The weirdness doesn't stop there though, it also has something called a love index, which, a love index excuse me, which is affected by how you actually speak to the robot in moments of stress. So for example, if the robot says, hey I need to be charged and you don't charge it quickly, it will apparently decide that you don't love it anymore and react in a similar fashion. And if it feels unpopular, it will no longer empathise with you during gameplay. And essentially, if you're like mean and like getting tilted, like I tend to do, it will just probably just be not as nice to you anymore. I guess Sony is trying to make people less toxic. Like I guess. Now, obviously, this is just a patent. This does not mean that this will ever see the light of day, and I don't think it will because who would willingly buy this? I just, I just, I'm just thinking like, who is the audience for this thing that you'd have to probably spend a lot of money on? So this is probably just a pattern that they're playing around with, maybe they'll use certain parts of it for certain things, or maybe there will be an actual weird demonic Furby that'll sit next to you on the sofa when you're playing Sekiro or whatever and getting really tilted like I tend to do whenever I play that game. Yeah, bit of an, bit of an odd one. Um, the pattern page isn't actually loading for me at the moment, so... Apologies for that, but hopefully it will work for you guys. I'll put it there for your queries or regards. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe. It does help out a great deal. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul and I'm the Union Tech. Dot com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you are having an amazing day. We have lots of news to get through in this video, but I want to start things out with AMD, specifically a potential leak for the release date for their upcoming CPUs and GPUs. To be clear, Ryzen 4000 and Big Narve RDNA 2, Narve 2X, whatever you want to call it, has been long way since the good old days when Mercury was considered. medicine. Wireless electricity to power airplanes was a thing, and the first lead acid batteries ruled the world, which funny enough, had an energy density of less than 40 watt hour per liter. But since its invention in 1859, batteries were never a big hit. They even tried to use it with electric cars at the time, 
but these batteries weren't powerful enough to do anything with it. It would take 120 years for batteries to get somewhere when during the 1970s and 80s, lithium-ion technology was in the works by John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham, Rashid Yazami, and Yakira Yoshino. But the early lithium batteries were famous for a few problems, ranging from losing capacity with a short period of time to bursting into flames. Let me put it this way, they weren't as reliable as they are today. In 1991, lithium-ion batteries started to be commercialized by Sony, which was one of the first companies to have this technology, and at this point in time, the energy density increased only a little, or from about 40 Wh per liter to about 190. 30 years later, and Samsung is close to finalizing its research towards an all-solid-state battery, which delivers an unprecedented 900 Watt per liter, and a minimum lifetime of a thousand cycles. Hold on to your lunches, my dear viewers, because things are about to get interesting. Hello everyone, Subject Zero here. Lithium is by far the best candidate for high energy density batteries. Not only is abundant in nature, but in theory, its energy density of 6,389 watt hour per liter can surpass that of gasoline. Just to give you an idea, the energy density provided by gasoline is at current, or at the making of this video, about 15.8 times more energy dense than batteries, or 9,500 watt hour per liter compared to lithium ion batteries ranging from 250 to 600. Of course, if you take into account that gasoline combustion cycle is less efficient, such that for every liter you burn, you get at most 40% of that energy, then the difference drops to about 6.3 times. But let's go with that, assuming efficiency to be around 40%. Side by side, we can easily see why interest in batteries increased so much in the past decade. What this means is that if we could reach the full potential of lithium ion batteries, the range per charge for Model 3, for instance, would be multiplied by almost 10, or from 518 kilometers to 5,000 kilometers in one charge. What it also means is that instead of having six to 8,000 batteries, we could have cars with only one to 2,000 batteries with a range of 1,000 kilometers, if not more. Not only that, but decreasing the number of batteries makes it safer, charges faster, and is more environmentally friendly. But that is only possible with solid-state batteries. And we all know that there are mainly two problems with them. The first one is dendrites, which causes volume expansion, ultimately causing the battery to fail or even burst. Then we have the low coulombic efficiency, which causes the battery to degrade faster, having a lower life cycle. And let's not even enter the discussion of how complicated it is to work with lithium. Any contact with oxygen, hugs and kisses to your right hand. What Samsung claims to have achieved is the end of all of that. Their recent article in Nature explains how they created a battery with 900 watt hour per liter and a thousand cycles. This represents a 50% improvement in terms of energy density, while more than 200% of battery life cycle. How they achieved this is fascinating. Samsung research was led by Young Gung Li for an all-solid-state battery. Their goal was to eliminate dendrites formation and increase coulombic efficiency. To do that, they sandwiched layers of lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide mixed with a sulfide solid electrolyte on top of a nanocomposite layer of silver carbon. All of this is located in between a foil of aluminum and stainless steel as the current collectors. The idea behind this was to remove lithium foil from the mix and have all lithium atoms part of the NMC or the SSE. This approach diminishes the cost of the overall battery manufacturing since handling lithium usually needs an oxygen-free environment due to its higher reactivity. This is important for a few reasons. In conventional lithium batteries, the anode comprised of lithium moves freely towards the positive electrode during discharge. Dendrites are formed during the charging process, when lithium moves back to its initial location thanks to the free movement enabled by liquid or gel electrolyte. This is the main limiting factor of how much energy can be stored in these batteries, since to control this, the amount of lithium available in the system has to be capped, limiting the energy density. 
the sulfide solid electrolyte approach. The guys lithium back and forth with a little help from silver in a uniform manner, allowing the atom to be deposited in flat layers with little to no chance of dendrites forming. Nice, right? But Samsung took this idea a step further. Most solid state battery technologies proposed to date have some sort of nanomatrix layer compound, like silica for instance, that is used to absorb lithium ions. By removing this layer and having only silver atoms playing the part of the matrix to guide the ions, you can effectively introduce more cathode into the mix, increasing the overall energy density of the battery, or 900 plus watt hours per liter. This approach also increases battery lifetime efficiency by 200%. In this scenario, all lithium in the system is allocated within the NMC molecules comprising the cathode of the system. Here, there is no anode and the stainless steel sheet works as the current collector to drive the reaction. So, the battery is initially in a discharged state. When the battery is being charged, lithium ions pass through the carbon layer attaching themselves to silver atoms. This in turn promotes a better connection of the lithium layer onto the stainless steel current collector. What you get in the end is a clean sheet of lithium silver free of dendrites. This cycle can be repeated more than a thousand times flawlessly. Samsung solved many problems here, but one of them stands out, and that is the construction of the battery. By having only the NMC cathode embedded into a solid electrolyte and separated by the nanolayer of silver carbon, it eliminates the need for oxygen-free environment necessary for the construction of the battery, ultimately reducing cost. Although this is a huge gain, the impact on price for these new batteries is yet to be seen. But we know for sure that at least 35% of the final cost is due to manufacturing overhead, which includes energy costs, research and development, production, sales and so on. Then we have the remaining costs attributed to materials alone, comprising 60% of the final price. As I mentioned in an older video of mine, Cobalt and Nickel are to blame, since prices are increasing due to the high demand for these elements. That's why most companies are trying to move away from these elements. But it's safe to assume that Samsung may have used NMC here just to test the concept and acquire real-world numbers from this first prototype. At this point, it's still unclear where Samsung intends to use these batteries, but well, one thing is for sure, they still need more research and development so they can get rid of the Nickel and Cobalt. If they achieve this, then they will have the triple crown breakthrough. Cheap elements, high energy density, and a long lifetime cycle. And that is when we'll finally have a dramatic drop in battery prices. Overall, this is a huge step forward for a solid state batteries, and we can safely say that we are closer and closer to an electric future. All right, folks, that's it. We're done here. video about batteries
an entire computer from scratch on breadboards like this? Well, it might seem like a strange question for someone who's basically made an entire YouTube channel out of doing precisely that. Uh, and I sell kits with all the parts so you can do it yourself. So obviously I'm a pretty big fan of building computers on breadboards. And the big reason I really like it is that it forces you to think through how everything works. It always felt like something was missing with these projects where you get a pre-made circuit board and you just solder a bunch of components to it. And don't get me wrong, it's great if you want to learn how to solder, but once you know that, I, I just don't see how attaching a bunch of components to a circuit board teaches you much about electronics. In fact, the typical experience is that you solder the whole thing together, plug it in, and it, it just works the first time. So there's nothing to troubleshoot. There's no need to understand how it works. And so you don't. This, on the other hand, you know, it really forces you to think about each individual connection each pin, and as you build each section, uh, testing it, you know, each as you go, there's a very good chance things aren't going to work perfectly the first time, and that's a good thing. You know, it forces you to think about why, and, and it helps you build a deeper intuition for how it all works. And so that's what I really like about doing big projects like this on breadboards. But aside from being a lot more work, which, which I think is a good thing, there are definitely some caveats to be aware of when building complex projects like this on breadboards. First, not all breadboards are the same. There's a big difference in quality between the cheap $2 breadboards you can get and a higher quality $8 or $9 breadboard. And, and it's true, they look pretty similar, but let's take a look inside. Each row on the breadboard is connected with a metal strip that grabs the wires that are inserted. And if I dig under the backing, um, I can remove that uh, metal piece so we can take a closer look at it. And here it is, this is what it looks like. If we take a closer look, you can see the wires are inserted like this here and uh, make contact with, with the metal here. And in a good quality breadboard, these, this metal is nice and flexible. And you breadboard. can see even if you insert the wire at kind of a weird angle uh, like this, it flexes like that um, and then pops back nicely. You can also see it's nicely shaped so that when you insert the wire on the top, which is, which is what you'd be doing, um, you know, it, it kind of finds its way in there nicely. So uh, these make very good contact with the wire, um, spring back so they can last a while. So now let's take a look at the cheaper breadboards. Now the construction on the cheaper breadboard is pretty much the same. So it's actually pretty hard to tell the quality just by looking at a breadboard. Which is unfortunate because it means it's easy to pay for a high quality breadboard and end up receiving one that is lower quality. It may not even be the fault of the person selling it to you, since they may just not realize that there's such a big difference. Uh, but anyway, here's the same piece from the cheap breadboard. So let's take a look at the difference. And so you can see it's the same basic shape, but right away you can see there's a huge difference here. You know, the metal's just not um, not as springy, and so it doesn't snap back together, and so it may not make great contact with the wire, as you can see here. And it actually gets worse, you know, over time if you, uh, you insert something big, you can actually bend this out of shape. And I mean, that's maybe a little bit extreme for what you might stick into a breadboard. But once that's bent out of shape, you know, nothing, you know, you're not going to make great contact. Um, and so the, the quality of this breadboard and the quality of the connections you're going to get is, is much worse. There's a big quality difference, and you can even see the, you know, just the shape of the, of the top there where the wire goes in is very different um, and much less consistent on the lower quality one. So the quality of the breadboard matters. You, you can run into a lot of problems building a more complex project like a computer on these cheaper breadboards because you just can't be as sure that all the wires are making good content. And you can check out my website for more information on what breadboards I recommend. And of course, if you get it Hits, they're all going to come with these high quality breadboards. But okay, even with the best breadboards, there's still a lot of limitations to building a complex design like a computer on breadboards versus a custom print circuit board or even these uh, you know, soldered prototyping boards. And that's because the physical properties of the conductors in the circuit, whether that's the traces on the print circuit board or the wires and, and breadboards in, in something like this, you know, those conductors and everything have uh, physical properties that affect the circuit. For example, it's easy to look at two wires like this, you know, let's say these two wires here, and think, well, okay, you know, this wire connects this point here to this point here, here. this wire connects this point here to this point up here, and maybe 
maybe they don't really have anything to do with each other. And that's not entirely true. Anytime you have two pieces of metal close together, like you have these two wires that are close together, maybe, you actually have a capacitor. And that's why the schematic symbol for a capacitor is two plates next to each other. Uh, and the way a capacitor works is you have a difference in electrical potential on either side, and a charge builds up between these two plates. And another way of saying that you have a difference in electrical potential between two points is saying that you have a voltage across those points. That's you know, what a voltage is. It's always you know, sort of a voltage measured between the two points, and it's just the difference in electrical potential between the points. But with a capacitor in here, if you try to change that voltage, um, the capacitor will, will actually try to prevent that. You know, so if you try to increase the voltage by, by you know, adding more charge to one side, the capacitor is actually going to absorb that charge and it's charge up a bit uh, before the, the voltage uh, between the points actually changes. And then if you try to decrease the voltage here by, by pulling some of that charge away, the capacitor will discharge as much as it can to keep the voltage from dropping. And you know sometimes you want that. So for example, on the power or rails, you actually don't want the voltage to fluctuate, right? We have five volts coming in, and we want five volts everywhere on our power rails to be actually five volts. We don't want to drop in and things like that. So if a, if a chip is switching a circuit on and off, and it has to draw more current to do that, we don't want the voltage on the power rail to drop. And so it's actually a good practice to add uh, some capacitors just to across the power rail like this. So I'll actually add a couple of 0.1 micro prepared capacitors here across the power rails to help stabilize the, the five volts that, that are on those power rails. And really the, the best practice here is to have one of these capacitors for every chip that's on, on any circuit. So for example, we could have a capacitor here directly from five volts to ground across this uh, power rail for, for this chip here, like this. So that means that if this chip has, has any uh, change in the amount of current it needs to draw from, from its power rails, it's always going to see a consistent 5 volts or, or as, close, uh, as close as we can get to that. So the closer you can put the capacitor to the power inputs for, for any particular chip, the, the more, uh, the better, better stabilized the power is going to be for, for that chip. And that's, uh, I guess, one of the, the other maybe drawbacks of breadboards is that it's, it's you know, kind of hard or, or at least inconvenient to get these capacitors directly across uh, the power rails of a chip like this. You've got to kind of put it across and some of these chips. The, the power is it's just kind of an inconvenient place. But I think, you know, for what we're doing, it's probably good enough just to have a couple capacitors here. These will still help stabilize the power rails without, you know, really getting in the way too much. So that's fine, you know, we can add capacitors here if we want to stabilize the voltage and keep the voltage from changing, like we do on the power rails. But elsewhere, you know, we have signals that need to change voltage rapidly. And any of these signals uh, need, need to change voltage rapidly because they're you know, varying signals and, and, and they have to change. And so the stray capacitance that inherently exists in a breadboard, or even a printed circuit board, can cause problems. And, you know, since one factor that determines how much charge larger capacitor uh, can hold is the is actually the physical area that will, will conduct the plate to the capacitor, you're more likely to have a lot more capacitors in the breadboard circuit because you've got a lot more metal in the breadboard and then all those wires. Now another related phenomenon is inductance. And if you've learned a little bit of physics, you might know that anytime you have a current flowing through a wire like this, there's a magnetic field that is generated uh, around that wire. Of course, if you have a lot of wire, uh, especially well wound up like this, you can use uh, that magnetic field to do work. And that's how a motor works. And that actually works in reverse as well. So right now I'm using uh, current to generate a magnetic field that's pushing against this fixed magnet here. But any motor is also a generator, and that's because a changing magnetic field around the wire will induce a voltage in the wire. So when I spin this, the magnetic field from the permanent magnet changes relative to the wire and induces a voltage in the wire. So what does this mean for a breadboard computer? 
Well, you know, if you've got a wire uh, with a current going through it, you're going to have a magnetic field around that wire. And if the current flowing through the wire changes, then the magnetic field is going to change. So if, we, so if we go from a smaller current to a larger current, we're going to go from a smaller mag magnetic field to a larger magnetic field. But remember, if you have a changing magnetic field around a wire, then the voltage, that'll induce a voltage in the wire. And it just so happens that the voltage that's induced will oppose the change in current. And so you've got capacitance, which opposes a change in voltage, and inductance, which opposes a change in current. And both effects are relatively small, unless that voltage or current is changing very rapidly. Well, how rapidly? You know, if we take the 6502 computer that we're building, I've said that I plan to run this at one megahertz. So are we going to have any issues with one megahertz signals? You know, so that's potentially alternating between zero and five volts a million times per second. You know, is that going to be a problem? Well, we can run a little experiment. I've got a breadboard here with a bunch of connections, and I can feed a signal in on one side, and you can see I'm, I'm measuring that signal as well. If we look on the oscilloscope, you can see there's this uh, 100 kilohertz sine wave uh, that we're measuring going in. And so that goes in on this side, and then it goes through a whole bunch of connections, and then we can measure it uh, coming out over here. Now I also have a resistor here to kind of isolate the input and output measurements. Um, and aside from that induced current that we're going to be looking at that, that I mentioned, um, I don't expect any current flowing through that resistor. So Ohm's law says no current flowing through it means no change in voltage. So we should measure the same voltage going in here and coming out over here. So here's the signal going in. It's a one kilohertz sine wave, and we're measuring that over on the left here. But we can also measure the output on the right. And so if I overlay that, you can see um, it's pretty much the same thing. And, you know, that's not too much of a surprise since we basically just have a wire going through the breadboard. But if we increase the frequency, I can dial this up, so that was 100 kilohertz. So if we keep going up, we can go up to one, me uh, 1 megahertz, zoom in here, and it still looks like pretty much the same signal going in and out. Uh, but if we keep going, higher and higher frequencies, zoom in here, you actually start to see something happening here. You see the output, which is the yellow, actually no, the yellow is the input, so you, see, so you see the green, which is the output, is actually shifting a little bit from the yellow. So there's, there's a phase shift happening there, which is kind of interesting. And, and that is perhaps because that inductance and capacitance that I, that I talked about is going to resist a change in voltage, it's going to resist a change in current. And so it may delay um, and, and actually cause that phase shift. So we're starting to see that. And if we go higher and higher frequencies, you'll see not only does the phase shift increase, but you also see the green, which is the output, is actually decreasing. So it's, it's starting to attenuate. And so if we go higher and higher frequencies, and that's about as high as we can go, up to 20 megahertz is as, is as high as I can go with this. But you can start to see that the green signal, which is our output, is being attenuated. It's being phase shifted and it's being attenuated. And actually what I can do is I can automatically sweep through all of the frequencies here. So I'll do a, do a let's see, frequency response analysis and run analysis. And what this will do is it'll actually sweep through all the frequencies from 100 hertz all the way up to 20 megahertz, which is as fast as this will go. And what you're seeing is it's plotting the phase shift, uh, which is, I believe, the red line. So you can see that's staying pretty close to zero. And then it's also uh, plotting the gain, or in our case, attenuation, which is the blue line. And that's also staying pretty close to zero. And here we are at 100 kilohertz, and it's still pretty close to zero. As we approach one megahertz, you see the phase shift is starting to change. And that's you know what we saw when we were looking at it ourselves. And then as we get, um, you know, looks kind of five megahertz or, or beyond, we're starting to see the blue line is also dipping um, by, you know, a few decibels. And so that's showing that at higher and higher frequencies, we're starting to lose uh, some of our signal integrity. Something else is kind of interesting. If we go back and just look at the waveforms here, remember that the attenuation and phase shift that we're seeing is a result of uh, both capacitance between uh, conductors here, as well as inductance, which is actually a magnetic field that's generated around these conductors. So if we actually change sort of the physical shape here, uh, or properties, or, or you know, some relationships between the different wires, you can see, just as I poke at this, that the phase shift and the, the attenuation that we're seeing is, is changing a bit as well. And you know, this is at 20 megahertz. But I, th I, don't know, I think that's pretty interesting to, to see that. So you can see at higher frequencies, we are starting to see some signal integrity issues. But, you know, we want to run our computer at 1 megahertz here. And 1 megahertz looks like, you know, no problem.
problem, right? We're you know, still zero attenuation. Our uh, phase shift here hasn't shifted by very much at all, uh, one megahertz. And even the attenuation that we do see is exaggerated quite a bit because of that existing to make this uh, more of a worst case demonstration. So even in this you know, pretty messy scenario that we've got here, things look pretty clean up to one megahertz. So we ought to be fine, right? Well, it's not so simple. The clock for the computer is one megahertz, but it's not a sine wave like we've been looking at. It's a square wave. You know, it just toggles from zero to five volts. But in reality, any signal, including a square wave, is actually made up of sine waves. So here's a one megahertz sine wave, and I'm generating with this first formula here, which has a frequency of one million. And so you can see the period here is a one times 10 to the minus six, the one microsecond. So, so that's one megahertz. But of course, it's a sine wave, and we're looking for a square wave. Well, we can get closer to a square wave by adding another sine wave to it. So here is a three megahertz sine wave, and I've made it one third, third of the amplitude. And if I add these two together, so f of x and g of x, if I add those together, we get this, which is a little, little bit more square shaped. But if I add to that h of x, which is a, a five megahertz square wave, 150 the amplitude, and we add h of x, you can see it gets a little more square shaped. And we can keep going. I can add this next sine wave, which is seven megahertz. And you can see it gets even more square shaped. You know, the slopes are a little bit steeper here. The tops are a little bit flatter. And in fact, to get a true square wave, we could add up all of the odd numbered multiples of the fundamental frequency, which in this case is one megahertz. And if we add all of those up all the way to infinity, that would give us a true square wave. Let's take a look at this other set up here that I've got. So I've actually got a formula here that represents um, the sum of odd number multiples of one minus sum of one wave. And if it is a 2k minus 1 factor in here, as well as dividing by 2k minus 1. So if k goes, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then 2k minus 1 is going to go 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 9. So that, that gets all of the odd multiples. And then we're summing up all of those for k going from 1 all the way up to n, which right now n is also now we're only getting the first term, which is why we just see that one minute sine wave. Then I've got some other stuff in here just to kind of scale this up, and uh, we're adding two and a half here, um, just so that this this wave over overall goes from you know around zero at the bottom to around five at the top, just to kind of give us something like that zero point five volt uh, square wave that we're looking for. Now this makes it easy for us to add more terms because I can just change that n. And so this is where we were before with n equal to four, uh, with four terms. But we can keep going. And the more and more terms that I add, the more and more it looks like a square wave. But also, the more terms that we add, the more uh, the, the higher the, the, the frequency. So this looks like a nice sharp square wave, but the frequency, you know, the maximum frequency that I'm using to get that is over 100 megahertz. So, you know, in reality, because high frequencies like 150 megahertz are going to be very susceptible to small amounts of capacitance or small amounts of inductance, like we've got in, in a breadboard circuit, we're definitely not going to see, you know, perfect square waves with you know, perfectly steep slopes like this uh, or anything like that in real life. So the question is, you know, is that a big deal? Well, in my last video, we looked at this timing diagram for the 6502 CPU, and we figured out that we weren't going to have any problems com uh, complying with all of the constraints that are set out in here. But there's one actual uh, timing requirement that I kind of glossed over that actually turns out to be one of the hardest constraints to meet. And that's you know, this time here, this TF, which is the fall time, and TR, which is the rise time of the clock. So what is that requirement, fall time and rise time? Well, we flip over here. You can see the fall time, rise time is a maximum of five nanoseconds. Five nanoseconds is not a lot of time. And just to get a picture of that, I can add um, two li lines here that are five nanoseconds apart. So I'll add these two. And these are centered around you know, 5 times 10 to the minus. 
a seventh, which is half a microsecond, so it's centered around this point, which is halfway through. And then it's uh, bracketed, you know, plus or minus two and a half uh, nanoseconds. So, and then two and a half. so minus two and a half, to plus two and a half is going to give us a gap here between these two lines of, of uh, five nanoseconds. And so, as you can see, you know, five nanoseconds is really short. So let me zoom in here and see if we can uh, you know, see what's going on. Going on with it better. So I'll change the x-axis to go from 4 times 10 to the minus 7 to 6 times 10 to the minus 7. So there we can see things a little bit better. And you can see we're going from you know 5 volts down to 0 volts within uh, that 5 nanosecond window. But remember, for this signal to exist that we're graphing here, this red signal, there must be a component of it that's you know 115 megahertz. Yeah, so if we don't think our breadboard circuit's going to handle 115 megahertz signal all that well, then we shouldn't expect to see a square wave with slopes you know quite this steep. So if we go down to you know let's say where maximum frequency is closer to you know maybe 30 megahertz, you can see here you know even in theory we def definitely can't transition from five volts down to zero volts within this uh, five nanosecond window. But, uh, you know, one piece of good news is that we don't actually have to get all the way from 5 volts down to 0 volts uh, in the time frame. You know, we just have to get from high to low. And it turns out that high is really anything above about 3.5 volts, and low is uh, anything below about 1.5 volts. So really, you know, something like, like this would be in spec, right, because we're going from, from the absolute minimum of of what's considered high to the absolute maximum of what's considered low, we're doing that within that 5 nanosecond window. So this would technically be spec. And so maybe that, that maximum frequency is really something more like, you know, you know it's hard to see, but maybe it's, maybe it's like 40, 43, 45 megahertz. And, and of course, this is just a model that, that shows all of the frequencies up to 45 megahertz and then none of the frequencies above that. In real life, you know, we'd still have all of the frequencies, it's just that as we get higher, they become more and more attenuated, uh, not to mention phase shift grid, as we saw. But it, you know, the point is that the model, you know, isn't perfect here, but hopefully it gives you just, you know, some sort of idea of what's going on. The other reality is that this 555 uh, timer clock module that I've been using um, is not exactly great at meeting that five nanosecond requirement either. And it's been working fine. We take a look at it, you can see, you know, this is five nanoseconds per division. So, you know, going from, you know, let's say it's one and a half volts here up to, to three and a half volts, which is actually about as high as it gets, is a little bit more than five nanoseconds. So, you know, it's not technically in spec, but it's been working fine. So for, you know, an educational or hobby project like this, particularly if we aren't running close to the 14 megahertz limit of the processor or we aren't at any temperature extremes or anything like that, yeah, there's plenty of tolerance and, and close enough is probably good enough. But let's look up this one megahertz oscillator and measure it and see how close we really are. And I've run out of room, so I'll need to add another bed here. Connect the power rails. And add the uh, oscillator here. And the oscillator is pretty straightforward. You know, we just connect power and ground to it. So power goes here to the so top left pin, ground to the bottom right pin over here. And that powers it up. And then this uh, top right pin, we're just going to get a 1 megahertz uh, square wave coming out of that. So let me hook up the power here. And obviously, the computer's not going to do anything because we have no clock connected to it now. Let's measure the output of the oscillator. So with the oscilloscope probe here, rather than using the ground lead, the best way to measure this, because the ground lead, I mean, this is a wire, it's got inductance in it, it's going to have all the same problems that all these other wires have. So to get the best measurement, you want to get rid of this. You also want to get rid of the clip. And you just want to use the probe, and then actually this little ring here is, is also ground. So you can use this uh, little ground thing, stick that on there, like that, and then you've got the ground and then the probe. So I put the probe here on the uh, output that we want to measure, 
And then the ground thing is just going to connect, or sort of, you know, be stuck to the case here. And that's, that's going to be ground, the case is grounded. So that's the best way to get a really accurate measurement of what's coming directly out of the oscillator. And if we take a look at that, we can see we've got a one megahertz square wave here. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see there is a little bit of overshoot and a little bit of ringing there, uh, kind of like we expected. But overall, it's a pretty sharp edge. So let's uh, zoom in here to, uh, this is now five nanoseconds per division. So between these vertical lines here, and these vertical grid lines is five nanoseconds. So you can see the actual rise time is much less than five nanoseconds. For the, for the whole thing. Shift things over here. So let's say our rise is starting right there. We're already up to five volts within about two and a half, maybe three nanoseconds. So measuring what's coming directly out of the oscillator like this, we've got a really great. <gasps> this was a, uh, was a good, kind of good game. As much of the breadboard as possible um, but with this measurement technique. In reality, by the time our signal gets uh, to our processor. It might be degraded a little bit, but let's let's take a look at that. Let's do that. So what I'll do is I'll connect the clock into uh, the rest of our clock uh, signal from the rest of our computer. So that's there, and we'll connect that down to our clock there. And so you can see we're taking the output of the clock, and it's going you know directly into uh, both the interface adapter as well as up to the, the CPU. And so the question is going to be, what does our clock look like as it's going into the CPU here? So we can do the same thing. I can measure, get this little uh, ground probe into our ground, and then get our regular probe into that part of the breadboard, and that'll measure the, the clock signal up here. And if you notice, it's, it's really not that bad. Uh, again, you know, this is five nanosecond per division here, so we're getting, you know, all the way from zero volts up to five volts in, you know, maybe it's got, taken a little bit more time. You know, maybe this, this slope's not quite as steep. Uh, perhaps I'll uh, edit this video to overlay the two of these so you can, so you can really compare, but at least one, eye, two, this, uh, just my memory of what the other one looked like. Hmm. It looks like the slope is a little bit less steep, but not terribly so. I'll do it later. And this is actually really encouraging. And now it's okay. when we were looking, uh, you know, theoretically, just doing the math, we needed, you know, 100 megahertz plus signals to get from zero volts to five volts within five nanoseconds. So this is this is very steep. Um, so we must actually be able to maintain those, those really high frequency, or at least enough of those really high frequency signals to be able to get something like this. So, so this this is very encouraging. So of course I've done everything. I can to get the best possible case. Obviously, using like oh, breadboards, these wires are as short as they could possibly be, um, and they route as directly as, as I could make them route. Um, and I think that is important for the clock circuit here. So, you know, some of these other signals, maybe you know, you can have longer wires or whatever, uh, but. The clock signal is one where, you know, because the data sheet has, has that spec of five minutes, of the five minutes of the call time, in order to meet that spec, it seems like it's worth you know, going to a little bit of extra effort to make those connections nice and as short as can. So everything looks good. We're running a clock at one megahertz. Um, so let's reset. Looks like there is still one problem, which is that our program to display Hello World doesn't actually seem to be working anymore. So if we reset, you know, we can try to disconnect, reconnect power, uh, but it's just not working. Though so it is sort of doing something, so let me actually disconnect and reconnect power. Disconnect this, reconnect it. You can see the LCD comes up and it's not initialized. But if we reset the computer so the Hello World program runs, you can see the LCD does appear to initialize. You know, it gets set to two-line mode. 
person shows up, but it doesn't do anything else. So it looks like there's still not might be some sort of problem running the computer at this higher speed. So, what's going on? Well, there's something I remember seeing in the datasheet for the uh, LCD controller um, you know, a while ago when we first hooked it up. And that is that there, there are several places in the datasheet where it says you have to be sure that it's not in the busy state before sending an instruction, right? When instruct being executed, no instruction other than a busy flag, a read instruction can be executed. Uh, the busy flag is set to 1 when an instruction is being executed. Uh, check it to make sure it's 0 before sending another instruction. Uh, be sure it's not in the busy state before sending instruction. And at the time we first hooked the LCD module up, I kind of glossed over this because we were running the clock so slowly that there was basically no chance that the LCD still be executed one instruction by the time we sent it the next instruction. In fact, I don't even know if I mentioned it at the time. But I do remember seeing this in the data sheet and making a mental note that I could you know, probably ignore it while we were running the clock really slowly, but that eventually I'd need to come back and actually add the code to read the busy flag and wait for some new instruction. But now that we've got a good uh, clock signal, it looks like everything else is working because the LCD is being initialized and the first instruction sent to the LCD is the one that initializes it and sets it to a two-line display mode that puts it in the state. It's just that all the rest of the instructions are probably coming too quickly before it's ready for any of them. So these instructions, you know, turning the display on, cursor on, clearing the display, these probably aren't actually working even though the cursor is on and the display is cleared. It's just that those are the defaults when the LCD first power is on anyway. And then, of course, these commands, where it actually prints each character, aren't working either. You know, all of these instructions are being sent so quickly that the LCD isn't actually done in executing the first instruction before the rest of them are sent. And that's because we don't have any code to check for that busy flag and wait to send the next instruction when the LCD is ready. And at 1 megahertz, it's just going too fast for the LCD. So since we've got a good clock signal, I, I, th I think all we need to do is just add the check for the busy flag, and you can do that, that entirely in software. And that's what I'm going to do in the next video. And remember, if you want to follow along with these videos, you can get all the what parts I'm using over at my website, peter.net slash 65 version. And for now at least, we're still able to ship kits during the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. And I'll keep my, my website up to date if that changes. But you know, if you're stuck inside and looking for something to do, you should cover it. It seems like every programming tutorial starts out having you write a simple program that just prints out hello world. And so, breadboards for computer engineering dedication or testing are good or better. 
a normal PCB. Defeated, unbelievable, but a wow, a good game. Thank you for watching and see you later.